One of the things many of us are missing as these weeks of social distancing continue to go on and on is simply the opportunity to be with people face to face rather than seeing people only on a computer or on a tablet or on a phone. We long to be with people in person. I'm sure that's especially true for many of you who might like to be with your mother or your grandmother on this Mother's Day. It was also true of the Apostle Paul, who was in Athens and away from Thessalonica and who was missing the people tremendously. And we hear the pain that he has at being separated from the Thessalonians in our scripture today. Jill already read part of it for you, and I'm going to pick it up now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 at verse 6, where Timothy is now returned from Athens with his wonderful positive report from the Thessalonians. And Paul says, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. He has told us also that you always remember us kindly and long to see us just as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, during all our distress and persecution, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For we now live if you continue to stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we feel before God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is our scripture for today. Today's scripture I find very insightful because it describes how we can find joy even when we're going through a time of hardship. Paul is living in a time that he describes as one of distress and persecution, and yet he's encouraged and he's feeling joy thanks to the Thessalonians. And I want to share with you four things today that I see in this passage that I hope will be helpful for you when you're facing or going through hardship. The first thing you need to do to get to a place of being able to experience joy and hardship is you need to know your opponent. You need to know your opponent. And by that I mean you need to know that evil is real and it is an active force in the world. Reading this passage, it's clear that hardship is simply a part of life. And so, first of all, you don't want to let it catch you unprepared. We want to expect that it's going to happen from time to time. In verses 3 and 4 and 7, Paul talks about the persecution that he and Silvanus and his team are facing. And Paul says persecution is to be expected. And so part of why they sent Timothy to the Thessalonians, Paul says, is so that no one would be shaken. You know, sometimes people will share with me about a struggle they're going through in their life, and they, they will act very surprised that whatever it is has happened. And part of what Paul is trying to teach us and telling the church is, don't be surprised when tough things are challenging or bad things happen. They happen in life. So be ready. Be prepared. And so a first step in facing hardship is simply recognizing that evil is real and it's an active force in the world. In expressing his desire to see the Thessalonians again, Paul writes something that may sound a little strange or odd to our 21st century ears. He says, for we wanted to come, come to you, I wanted to come to you again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Now some people may think, that sounds odd. 
That sounds like an excuse or even a justification for not making every effort to get back to visit the Thessalonians. And some people may feel quite simply, well, that sounds really quaint or old-fashioned. I don't even believe Satan exists. Well, if that expresses how you're feeling, and even if it doesn't, I want to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about what the New Testament teaches us about both Satan and evil. If you look at the foundational story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, which is found in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11, there are three different terms that Jesus uses and that Matthew uses in that passage to describe the adversary. And those terms are the devil, the tempter, and Satan. And these are all names for evil conceived as a personal will actively opposed to God and God's good will for the world. Now, in much of the New Testament, Satan is perceived as the source of moral evil, of suffering, and even of disease. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have an account of the story where Jesus is accused by his opponents of casting out demons by the power of the adversary. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 26 to 28, for example, he says, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So Jesus clearly believes that Satan was a real adversary with his own realm over which he had power and influence. In John's Gospel, in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus describes the devil this way. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. For this reason, we know that people who lie consistently and repeatedly are living more in the spirit of Satan than in the spirit of Christ, who is, as we read in John 14, verse 6, the truth. For example, early in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, we have this story of a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who sold some land and then came to the apostles to give them the proceeds, from the proceeds from the sale, but they didn't tell the truth about how much they sold it for. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Peter asked Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? In Acts chapter 26, in verses 17 and 18, Paul is relating about his experience of being encountered by the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And part of what he heard from the Lord was, I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those sanctified by faith in me. So very quickly, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, they all know their opponent. And they believe in the reality and power of the tempter, of Satan, the devil, whatever term you want to use. And Paul says, both in 1 Thessalonians and later in Ephesians chapter 6, that there are forces out there that are actively opposing God's good will for human life and for all of God's creation. So we can either prepare ourselves to do battle against them, or we can ignore them. We can deny the reality of evil, and in doing so, ironically, we end up giving evil more power by not opposing it. If two people enter into a boxing ring and one person is trained, hardened, and ready to fight, and the other person is untrained, doesn't know what's taking place, and doesn't know what's about to happen, you know who's going to get hurt, and you know it's not going to take very long. In the original Rocky movie, there's a scene during the climactic fight where Tony Duke Evers, who is Apollo Creed's trainer, is in his corner and he's trying to get Apollo to recognize what's going on. And he says to Apollo very urgently, he doesn't realize it's a show. He thinks it's a fight. Well, we're in a fight against evil in this world. 
And we're far more likely to get beaten and knocked out if we don't even realize the battle that we're in. Know your opponent. That's the first step if we're going to get to experiencing joy in hardship. We need to recognize that evil is a real and active force in the world and that hardship as a result is a part of life, so we don't want to let it catch us unprepared. We're all going to face hardship. And so the question is not, why am I facing hardship? The question is rather, what am I going to learn from it? What am I going to grow? How am I going to grow from it? How am I going to become even stronger for enduring it? Those are much better questions to ask. A second step towards finding joy in the face of hardship is to express your feelings. Express your feelings. Paul is really open and clear about his feelings towards the Thessalonians. And remember, this is a man. <laughs> Men aren't always the best at expressing their feelings, but Paul is really clear. Look at some of the phrases in this scripture. He writes about, and remember, it was a letter first. He writes about when he could bear it no longer. He had to send Timothy to them to find out how they were doing and how they were getting along. And he shares about how much he wanted to come. I wanted to. I wanted to come and see you. And how he longs for them. How he fears for them. And then after hearing Timothy's report, how he's filled with joy because of them. I mean, this part of 1 Thessalonians really sounds like a love letter. And I read this and I think about, gee, am I as open and clear in expressing my feelings as Paul is? Are you? How open and clear are you about sharing your feelings and expressing your feelings to those around you? Because when we express our feelings, people don't have to guess what's in our head or what's in our heart. And expressing our feelings appropriately, what Paul will write in another letter of speaking the truth in love, and not in an angry way, not in a manipulative way, not in a sarcastic way, speaking the truth in love and expressing that is very important for healthy relationships. And because Paul expressed his feelings for the church clearly, and the Thessalonians did too, both Paul and the church end up being encouraged. Expressing your feelings helps to provide clarity, comfort, and reassurance in relationships. I'm happy to have Jill participating in our service today because as we discuss this passage and I was sharing about the love and joy that Paul felt for the Thessalonians, Jill and I started talking about how similar our feelings are for all of you and how much joy and how blessed we feel to have been connected with all of you here at BBC for so many years. And we've had the blessing of being connected to you all for 25 years, much, much longer than Paul got to benefit from his relationship with the Thessalonians. And what Paul expressed about his relationship with that church is very similar to how we feel about all of you. As Paul said, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Honestly, Jill and I could have written this letter to all of you just like Paul did to the Thessalonians. Well, expressing and sharing our feelings is mutually beneficial. I'm sure many of you have been encouraged by the other people expressing their feelings to you and even for me and these last weeks, I've been encouraged by so many of you who have been contacting me one way or another, whether through text or email or sending actual notes and cards. Uh, and I just appreciate all of your kind words, your prayers, your words of appreciation. It gives me energy. It gives me encouragement, which is part of the third thing that I want to share with you. Because after knowing our opponent and expressing our feelings, the third thing to find joy in hardship is we want to understand how faith works. Understand how faith works. Our faith is personal, but it's not private. 
And that's a hugely important distinction to understand. Nowhere in the New Testament is faith described as private. Our faith impacts the faith of other people, whether we realize it or recognize it or not. It either serves to strengthen the faith of other people, or it can cause the faith of other people to weaken or to waver. When our lives, our decisions, our words, our choices, our actions positively reflect and demonstrate our faith, that can help to strengthen the faith of other people. When we waver, that can lead other people to wavering. Paul expresses this very clearly in verse 5 where he says, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. You hear the clear implication. If their faith had wavered, Paul would feel like everything I did was in vain. It was useless. And his faith would be weakened also. The faith of the Thessalonians was personal, but not private. If they had been tempted away from the faith, it clearly would have impacted Paul in a negative way. And in hard times, our faith helps us to hold on, but it also helps other people to hold on too. It's like the beach grass that we see all over the Cape that help to hold the dunes in place. When you walk by beach grass, it may look like each blade of grass is just an individual strand, but we know that underneath the surface, the roots of the grass tend to spread and they intertwine and it helps to hold the sand and the dunes in place, which helps the grass to hang on. Well, that's what kind of Paul is expressing when he says, we have been encouraged about you through your faith, for we now live if you continue to stand firm in the Lord. This verse expresses beautifully the interconnectedness of our mutual faith. Paul was encouraged through the faith of the people. Now, we have to be honest. All of us have times and seasons in our life when our faith does weaken and waver. And it's at those moments when we need to rely on the faith of those who are close to us to help carry us through. This can be especially true when we're going through times of grief. I received a beautiful letter here at the church this past week from someone who had lost her spouse a little while ago now. And she was just now, as she wrote, wanted to take the time to express her gratitude and her appreciation to the church, to her small group, to our friends here at BBC, to all of us who helped her through that very difficult period. And she was sharing how now she's come through the worst part of grief and she's in a better place and in a good place now, thanks to the people around her who, if you will, stood firmly in the Lord and expressed their feelings of compassion and caring and stood with her in friendship and they also did the final thing, the fourth thing I want to share with you today, and that is they shared their love with her. If we hope to find joy in hardship, we need to know our opponent, that evil is real. We need to express our feelings, to understand how faith works. And then fourthly, we need to share our love. Timothy brought the good news of the Thessalonians' faith and love back to Paul. And Paul noted how they remembered him kindly and how they longed to see him just like he longed to see them. And the Thessalonians expressed their feelings of love for Paul. Paul, in return, expressed his feelings of love to them. I often think people don't realize how powerful it is when we express our feelings of love to other people. Many of us perhaps didn't have this modeled for us by parents, by mothers or fathers perhaps, who didn't say the words, I love you, as much as we might have wanted to hear them. You know, some people will say, well, I'm not comfortable saying things. I tried to show my love by what I did. And while that's important, it's also important for people to hear those words. So, when Paul heard from the Thessalonians that they were longing to see him as well and sharing their love, it filled Paul with joy. And Paul's prayer for the church 
is that the Lord would make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. You know, our, the way we think and talk about love, it's often we think about it, well, there's our familial love and we love the people in our family. There's eros or romantic or passionate love, perhaps for our spouse if we're married. But Paul is always driving the, the story of Christian love to, it's not just about loving those who love you, it's about love for all. And I love this image of increase and abound in love. Uh, one of the things I tend to do in our household uh, most of the time is I do the dishes. And Jill does the cooking, I do the dishes, I clean up. And it's like if you have a container that you're cleaning and it's filled with water. And what happens if you just turn the faucet on full blast into something that's already full of water? Well, it just comes pouring and spilling out all over the sides of the pot or whatever it is you're cleaning. That's kind of the image I have when I think of this increasing and abounding in love. That love should be spilling out of our life from every side, everywhere we go. You know, one of the things that uh, I've been encouraged by in the last two months is all the different ways that uh, I know many of you are sharing love with other people as we go through these times of social distancing. Uh, just from the last few weeks, uh, those, we are small group leaders, for example, who are doing everything they can to gather their groups via Zoom and so they can meet and express their concern for one another. And there's another small group that has a, a weekly Wednesday check-in and they all email each other and let each other know, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what's going on. And it's a way of keeping people sharing their love and connected. Uh, there's other people sending emails saying, hey, we've got to pray for this person who's going through surgery and going through a difficult time and sharing their love through prayer. And there's people doing other things like buying groceries every week for a couple in our church who really have to be careful and have to stay in their home because they're physically more susceptible if they ever got the virus to something very seriously happening to them. And Another person from our church who went to the home of another one of our more senior members to help her trying to figure out a computer problem so she could stay more in touch both with the, her family and with the church. These are all just a few examples of people sharing their love in practical, tangible ways. And even with the limitations that we're facing with social distancing and having to isolate at home, there are many, many ways we continue to share our love with others. You know, it seems to me that two of the primary ways of building strength and resilience and even getting to the place of experiencing joy and hardship, it really comes down to faith and relationships. And this is evident in today's scripture. The word faith is mentioned five times in these brief verses. And strengthening our faith in God and recognizing how our faith inter, interacts with other people's faiths and how our faith is mutually connected, strengthening our relationship with God and our relationships with other people, these are immensely helpful when we're facing hardship. Someone shared something with me this last week about just how much they need some sense of hope, some sense of encouragement, and how that they have been finding that through watching our worship services. And part of my reply to that person was, well, we are Christians, and we face hardship, we should face hardship, differently than other people who don't have faith in God, don't have the love of God, and the love that we have among ourselves to help us through these days. So to find joy even in hardship, remember, you get to choose where you place your focus every single day. Focus on faith. Focus on love and on your relationship with God and your relationship with people. And you will be able to build and cultivate a sense of joy that is not drowned out by fear or by uncertainty. I had a phone call this week from Cindy, whose mother, Vivian LeClaire, had passed away. Vivian and Fred LeClaire were wonderful, wonderful members of our church for many years before having to move off Cape. And I gave Fred a call to talk with him about the loss of the love of his life. 
And we only had a brief conversation because it was very hard for Fred. But you know, Fred and Vivian really embodied so much of what I've shared with you today. They were a couple who loved each other and loved God and their family very deeply. They were very open at expressing their feelings. Uh, Fred and I share a love of baseball, and he understood the idea that, hey, there's an opponent in life that we're playing against, so we've got to play well. And he recognized how their faith could be used to encourage and to strengthen other people. And Fred and Vivian were real encouragers to me and to Jill when they were a part of our church. So we want to... I wanted to close by sharing that because I know Fred will be watching in worship. And Fred, our thoughts and prayers are with you and with Cindy and with your whole family. And thank you for representing the kind of faith that we all aim for in our lives. Please join me as I pray. God, we recognize that we are living in challenging days. And we pray that you would help us like Paul and Silas and Timothy and the Thessalonians. God, help us not to be caught unaware by hardship, to recognize that evil is real and it is active in our world and we need to be ready for it and we need to oppose it. We thank you as we remember this Mother's Day how important it is to express our feelings to other people and to do so in love and with a thought for their situation and how much they need to hear the words that we can speak to provide comfort and reassurance. Help us to understand how faith works, that it's not just personal, but our faith actually impacts other people's faith and the faith of our whole community. And finally, help us to continue to share our love with others, even as you continue to share your love with us. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.